recording. A warm welcome to our PCS forum on women called to Catholic priesthood. I'm Bridget Mary Meehan, and I'm here with Mary Teresa Streck. We will be facilitating this session along with our translation team. And we are delighted to have our translation team with us, Francisco, Sherry, and Christina. Um, the People's Catholic Seminary Forum was really inspired by Sharon Henderson Callahan and Jeanette Rodriguez's new book, Women Call to Catholic Priesthood, that explores the calls, journeys, spirituality, theology of women called to Catholic priesthood in the Roman Catholic Church from ecclesial challenge to spiritual mm -hmm. renewal. We will open now with a beautiful prayer from the Women's Ordination Conference for Women's Ordination. Oh God of truth, you tear down every wall. Sing baptism, same spirit. I ask you please to mute yourself. We're hearing talking during this. Thank you. Please mute. Thank you. And calling for us all. Oh God of truth and justice, you tear down every wall. Sing baptism, same spirit, sing calling for And now it is my pleasure to introduce the authors of Women Called to Catholic Priesthood. Sharon Henderson Callahan is Professor Emerita and past academic dean of the School of Theology and Ministry at Seattle University. A scholar of ministry and leadership, Callahan has focused her research on both Roman Catholic and mainline Protestant ecclesial formation. Jeanette Rodriguez is a professor of theology and religious studies at Seattle University. Currently, she also serves as executive director of the Institute for Catholic Thought and Culture at the university. She is a border theologian studying Christian faith experience among different cultural groups. And now welcome Sharon and Jeanette. Thank you, uh, Mary Teresa and uh, Bridget Mary. Hello everyone. Let me first apologize for sounding like a frog, <laughs> but I'm just getting over laryngitis. <clears throat> I'm very happy to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. A mis hermanas y hermanos latinoamericanos también les quiero dar la bienvenida. Y si tienen una pregunta, lo pueden hacer en inglés o en español, ni modo. ¿no? So we're very happy to share with you um, our work, and I wanted to begin by sharing how it all started. Uh, I can't remember what year it is, but a couple of years ago, we went to a, um, uh, a seminar in Greece, right, to examine and explore the vision and the life and the work of the early women deacons of the church. And when I was there, I met one of your own, Juanita Cordero. Say hi, Juanita. And I, I, I saw her and I saw her in color. And I, in a way, I was like, oh, she must be a Protestant minister. <laughs> and so we started talking, <clears throat> found out that she's a Roman Catholic woman priest. I was like, really? And I was a little taken aback, um, kind of like, what? 
But in that trip, during that trip, as I got to know Juanita, and I heard her story, and I witnessed her joy about how she talked about her priesthood and the Eucharist and her journey, I thought, oh my gosh, this is a story worth telling. This is a story that must be told, you no? Know? And so I came back home and I went to my best friend, Sharon, <clears throat> who's an expert on religious leadership. I said, Sharon, <clears throat> I wanna write about this. Um, will you join me? Because between the two of us, I think we could put something together really good, really ethnographically sound. But of course, I'm a Catholic theologian at a Catholic Jesuit university, right? With you know who were the bishops. <laughs> And so I went, let me go talk to my dean. <clears throat> and I want, and so I went to my dean and I said, uh, Dean Powers, <clears throat> I want to invoke academic freedom. And he was like, oh no, Jeanette, now what are you gonna do? Right? And I was like, no, no, I want to do this study. And he goes, Well, you know, are you gonna take a position? I go, look, the Vatican said we couldn't talk about it. They said we could study it, right? So we're studying it. We're, we're doing a study, right? <clears throat> and that's what we did. So I'm going to turn it over to Sharon so she can give you a, a bird's eye view, a helicopter view of the uh, the participants. Like, who are these women that we we got to meet and, and talk with? Sharon. Thank you, Jeanette. And thanks for coming to ask me if I'd help with this, because it's been a really transforming experience for me. And I just want to say a shout out to those here who we interviewed, Bridget Mary and Mary Therese, for sure. I see Teresa Gregory, Juanita, thank you, Suzanne Thiel, um, Paula and Ed. We saw Paula on video when we were interviewing, but we heard about Ed, so it's great to see your face, Ed. Um, you all live in us as we went through this uh, process together. I'm checking the other screen. I don't wanna leave anybody out. If, if somebody that I missed, I don't see anybody else that we interviewed that I, that I missed. So, um, uh, Jeanette still works at the university and as a professor emerita, it means I have a lot more freedom. I can do whatever I want because the university isn't responsible for me. So I didn't go to a dean. I figured I'm fine. So there we are. Um, so we have tried, uh, and I would just like to say, uh, as I was reviewing the first chapter of the book in anticipation of this, um, I think it's really important to understand the kind of research that we did, especially in this movement of synodality in the church today, which Pope Francis is really calling us to deep listening and Jeanette, as Jeanette said, I've done a lot of work on different um, religious traditions. And when I was putting together this two volume edited piece, two articles really stood out to me. Uh, one was by Simone Campbell about the, the social justice movement of women religious. And the other was by Diane Kennedy, who is a Dominican. And I asked her to write about about religious women. And in both pieces, they went back to the uh, early time after Vatican II and reflected on how resistant, what the pushback was from male priests, bishops, then the then popes, and the categorization of women's voices as screaming, yelling, demanding, which you know, many men are, uh, and pardon me for the men here, not accustomed to dealing with women's anger and really um, don't know how to listen. So our task, I think, was to deeply listen and let women's voices be heard in a way that could be heard. And so this whole process of synodality that we're in I'm and Jeanette both are hopeful that um, there's a new way of listening. So we really concentrated on um, hearing, trying to categorize or thematize so that the voices could be heard. That's our goal in this book. And I hope that as you read it, you find that, that we actually 
helped in achieving that goal. So at the back of the book, we have a couple of demographic data. Um, we actually physically, either through Zoom or on site, interviewed 30, um, let me put it down again because I always forget this, 33 uh, women. And uh, we used a lot of written material and other kinds of material for the other nine. And we tried to cite where we got the other nine voices. So for a total of 42. Out of a potential 350, when you look at the variety of lists, which is a very significant number of people representing... Tanto, hay un número significativo de personas que repre... Uh, a significant number of people. Uh, sorry, sorry, excuse me. I'm sorry. I need to interrupt just because Christina is going to start interpreting right now. So I need to start the interpreting once again. I'm sorry for interrupting. No worries. Just Thank minute. you. Thank just you. Just one minute. Okay. Interpreting is already available. You need to choose your English channel once again. Y para la gente del canal español, para activar la interpretación tendrían que clicar en el botón del globo terráqueo que aparece en la pantalla o en el menú desplegable y seleccionar en la opción de interpretación el canal español. Muchas gracias. Thank you. I'm sorry for interrupting. You can go on. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Si je t'entends. Si je t'entends. So in, in the appendix, we would see the demographic data. And I think just overall, um, when we were doing the research, we started in 2019, February of 2019. Teresa was the first person we interviewed, and we were in a hotel room together with her sister. And that whole process stayed with me for a very long time. Suzanne, Bishop Suzanne was the second person we interviewed in her home at breakfast, I think, and we had a long conversation. And then we were launched. And so um, what we found was this kind of history of long service to the church. Um, many, many, many years, uh, upwards of 30 for many of you as, um, as you tried valiantly to figure out how to follow God's call through the roads that were available only to keep discovering that it wasn't the right, the right end, the Thank right you. call. So bad. And then um, because of that long yeah. time of service, Patty's father the ages of I'm, ordination okay, good. were, um, you know, older. And we tried to uh, elongate and describe some of that. So I think I'll turn it back to Jeanette so we can start talking about the content a little bit. Sure. So for this session, we want to focus on the first chapter. Uh, not the first chapter. We want to focus on the first theme about this call. Like, what is it about this call? What is it about it that made it so powerful that these women who so love the church, who have been lifelong members of this church that they love, were willing to go contra legum against the law, right? to respond obediently to this call, a call that kept coming and or, and or being affirmed in a multiple of ways. It's one story, I don't remember who it was, but it was a beautiful story about when she was a little girl and she knew she wanted to be a priest and she told her priest that, that she was gonna be a priest. He basically said, no, she runs off crying and smacks, you know, runs smack into some nun. And the nun says, quote, you will be who God wants you to be. Right. And so we kind of carry that as a banner. We will be who God wants us to be. Right. And so the, the, the task was to understand this call and the spirituality behind what sustains it and nurtures it up and against so many barriers. You know? And um, this was revelatory for us and extremely moving. So we were really interested in the spirituality of each of you as you um, responded to God's call. And um, both of us are steeped in scripture. So we had these running stories of scripture in our minds and we could identify so many of them. 
And so part of the task of writers and researchers is to say, is it our story to tell using your stories or is it your story to tell? And where we landed was it's your story to tell. So throughout, we tried to keep ourselves as much as possible in the background. We constructed the text in the sense that we hoped made sense for people, but we really wanted to elevate and uh, use and acknowledge your own story. So we looked at spirituality from a variety of viewpoints and we decided that uh, Bishop Patricia Friesen uh, really talks about call. And I, I love how she um, describes it. So on page four, I think um, we've cited her as uh, saying, your call is an inner attraction that stays with one over time and tends to flare up into one's consciousness now and then. She notes there's a struggle within each person as they consider whether they have the necessary gifts and talents, can, and these have to be confirmed by friends and community. And she, of course, names her own confirmation of her own call to priesthood in the 2000s, early 2000s, when she realized that her work in challenging um, apartheid in South Africa was similar to her work in challenging apartheid as a way of understanding oppression in the Roman Catholic Church. So she ta talks about this attentive listening, obedience to self, signs of the times, and then invoking the spirit. And I think if, uh, if you follow kind of the way the book evolves, we really attend to her kind of outline of, of call and response. And I think that's all we had prepared to say because we know Bridget Mary and uh, Mary Teresa have ideas for how to continue. But we wanna thank you each. Um, for your courage, for your willingness to share your stories, for your deep spiritual connection to each of us, and especially to those of you who risked being interpreted by these two women that are standing before you now. Thank you so much, Jeanette and Sharon. This was awesome. Um, we are delighted that you will be back with us for each of these sessions that are going to be on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. with interpretation services uh, also with us. So we would like now to continue the conversation that Sharon and Jeanette started in their book and focus today on when you heard the call to priesthood, how did you respond to it? and overcome any barriers. We'd ask you to try to uh, very much stay within two to three minutes so we can get as many people as possible to share. And um, please use the raise the hand function on your uh, Zoom menu. And uh, Mary Teresa and I will be calling on you and uh, we'll be keeping track at the time so that we'll hear from as many of you as possible who have been living the call over the years um, to reflect on that and to share. So uh, please uh, take a moment, use the raise the hand function. And we will call on you and then you please mute and unmute. Thank you. Luan. Luan. Yeah. Ça y est, j'ai levé, levé la main. Francisco, we're not hearing the uh, French interpretation. Uh, j'ai le droit là ou pas? Je peux, par... Je peux parler là Allô Oui, d'accord. Tu m'entends Ok. Euh, 
bonsoir à tous et à toutes. Yeah. Merci yeah. de me. De, de, ben, je, je peux juste témoigner que ma vocation elle est venue doucement, mais sûrement, mais euh, dès le départ. Euh, à la base, euh, moi, je suis une personne contemplative et méditative. Et donc, je, je suis très philosophe dans l'âme et je ne savais pas que j'étais aussi spirituel et religieux. Donc, j'ai vraiment découvert ça enfant. Et euh, surtout, quand j'ai après ma première communion euh, que j'ai fait à la Martinique, et là, j'ai senti l'appel de Dieu parce que c'était dans la nature, dans, un, vraiment dans quelque chose d'extraordinaire. Mais euh, cet amour de Dieu, je l'ai toujours eu parce que même quand je, euh, je l'ai quitté à l'adolescence et que j'ai voulu en faire qu'à ma tête, eh ben, il était toujours là. Et c'est ça qui m'a très étonné, c'est de me dire que en fait, j'étais quelqu'un qui a toujours été spirituel, même si euh, j'avais fait le minimum euh, de ma foi chrétienne et catholique. Et c'est euh, cette liberté de, du libre arbitre que nous donne le Seigneur qui m'a permis de me dire mais à quel point... Euh, il nous laisse libre d'aller à notre rythme pour le rencontrer et qu'il n'y a pas d'obligation et qu'il n'y a pas un chemin tout tracé et que moi, je me suis amusé à, à faire pendant 20 ans, euh, j'ai mis ça sous le tapis, je ne voulais pas reconnaître que j'avais cette vocation-là. Puis j'ai passé 20 autres années à, à hésiter et à être plein de doutes à le fait d'y aller. Mais au, au total, ça fait 40 ans, un peu comme la traversée du désert du peuple hébreu, et, mais c'était nécessaire pour que je puisse à 60 ans me réveiller en me disant bon, j'arrête d'hésiter, j'y vais et c'est depuis euh, ma rencontre avec euh, les femmes de tout apôtre dans ce collectif que j'ai rencontré Christina et que quand on a vu que nos interventions euh, à la fois dans les réseaux et publics de de faire bouger les choses par rapport à l'église catholique ça ne bougeait pas et en 2022 j'ai pris la décision de poser ma candidature à l'ARCWP et c'est ainsi que, petit à petit, bah, je chemine avec vous, avec beaucoup de joie et de liberté d'être qui je suis dans ma vocation de femme prêtre à venir. Donc, je vous remercie infiniment de m'avoir accueilli et euh, de me permettre de pouvoir, euh, finalement, euh, aller dans cette vocation d'aimer transmettre ma foi en Christ et que je suis légitime en tant que femme, même si je suis une femme transgenre. Voilà, je vous remercie beaucoup de votre attention. C'est bon, Christina Merci. Thank you, Lon. Thank you, Lon, very much. Thank you. Uh, uh, Regina. It was only a clapping, not a, a hand sign. Uh, please wait a moment. I'm correcting the English version at the moment. <laughs> So while, G while Regina is getting ready, if there's anyone else who would like to contribute, please raise your hand. Okay. Elaine, yes, right. please. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I just love this book. Uh, it is so helpful, and I'll be loaning it to many of my friends as a way of explaining, describing the organic process that leads us to uh, the priesthood today. Uh, it's just a wonderful update. Um, so my my call started early, um, right after Vatican II, um, and it was a slow burn. It was a slow process. Uh, I was active in grassroots uh, church groups, um, training for uh, pastoral counseling, spiritual direction and uh, journeying with several uh, base communities. And we began to hold our own Eucharistic liturgies in our homes with or without uh, the ordained among us. Uh, and I thought I would be content to continue doing priestly work. 
without the official ordination and then um, found that that was no longer acceptable, that I, um, I, I needed to embrace in a public way, in an official and sacred way among this body in the women's priest movement, my ordination as a, as a Catholic priest. And um, several factors led to that. One of them being that when the pandemic hit and our clergy uh, in the institutional church insisted that people needed to show up uh, for the Eucharist to be there present on church property for the Eucharist, um, I knew that that was wrong, that we could uh, break bread where we are, with whom we are. And so uh, we went online, as you know, and um, that was one leading factor to accepting formally the ordination. Uh, and the other was the um, insurrection at our Capitol several years ago on January 6th. Um, I realized that I needed to leave this. When I leave this earth, it had to be with my fullest identity, to be authentic to the life God gives me. It's great to be with you. Thank you, Elaine. And now Juanita? I, uh, my call came way before Vatican II. I was 11 years old, and that's when the priest was still facing the altar. And during the Mass, when he raised the Eucharist, that's when God called me. And I thought, how no, there's no way. <laughs> Only men can be priests. So it stayed within me. I entered the Holy Name Sisters, was a sister for 10 years, loved teaching, loved being with them. And then God called me out again. And I thought, what the hell, where am I going? And I, a Jesuit brother said, there's a job opening in Phoenix, Arizona. I thought, where in the heck is that? I had to look it up on the map. And the call just kept coming. Well, I fell in love with a Jesuit priest who was stationed down in Tucson. And because I was in a Jesuit parish, he asked me to marry him. And I was fired, kicked out, contract terminated. So we ended up back in California and we have five kids, adopted one, a special needs child. And the call just kept burning and it was bubbling inside of me until Jules Hart came to our house to begin the filming of Pink Smoke Over the Vatican. And that's when I met some of the women who were called and they were going to be ordained deacons. Victoria Rue is going to be ordained a priest. And Don was asked to be the MC up in Toronto. And that was my first ordination of viewing it. And I realized the call was coming up even higher. And so I took the chance. I was teaching at a, a, a De Anza College at the time in education. And I wrote to uh, Bishop uh, Patricia Friesen and she said, welcome. And in those days, her computer was not the way computers are today. I had to mail everything to Germany. You know, so it took a long time to get answers and responses back. I remember, Virginia, we were there for your priestly ordination in Stuttgart, Susan and I. And it just once I said yes, once Patricia ordained me in Santa Barbara, the Immaculate Heart Sisters opened their chapel to me. I knew this is what God called me to. I have a wonderful Magdala Catholic community. I've been ordained almost 17 years and I work with the homeless. And I know every day this is what I'm called to. It doesn't matter what the institution said. Nothing is impossible with God. Amen. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you Juanita. <laughs> Wonderful. And now Katie. Uh, mine was a slow process of becoming aware. Um, I hope I can get this. Uh, you can see it. In the early 80s, I attended a a retreat by indigenous women or around indigenous spirituality outside of Washington, DC. And we were to choose a stone as a memory. And the words that were spoken to me was, you are called to be the servant of the servant of God's God. And I have pondered that through the years. I had started a hospice with a friend in the early 1980s in Blacksburg, Virginia, 
at the same time when I lived there, I was blessed by Bishop Walter Sullivan, who promoted leadership by the laity in the church. So first I completed a program for deacons. We weren't ordained deacons, but we had the same program. And then Bishop Sullivan, because of that training, offered or asked me to be the facilitator for creating a new Catholic community in Christiansburg, Virginia. And so I did. And the, we had about 90 persons worshiping in community with visiting priests for the sacraments. I was called to go to Virginia, to go to Chicago. And there I continued again another program under Bishop Sullivan of receiving a master's in pastoral studies uh, through New York to Loyola, New, New Orleans. So when I arrived in 96 in Chicago, joined a parish, an, an inclusive Catholic parish um, called the Herald, and continued my studies to get my master's, and also with the direction of my spiritual director, began the CPU e units to um, become a, a certified chaplain, a hospice chaplain. However, I lived a priesthood, and this is where I really felt this call to be servant. And I really can honestly say I celebrated almost all the sacraments with my patients and families, calling them to be a sacramental people and the people of God. So thank um thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you. Regina. I have to read it because my English is not so good. Um, I have translated from Germany in uh, German in English. Good evening. My name is Regina Ladewig. I have been following my calling to become a Roman Catholic women priest for 29 years and I am now 48 years old. I live in Germany near Stuttgart where Dr. Ida Raming is living. Since my studies and her ordination on the Danube in 2002, she has been a great role model to me and has now become a great bishop for me and many people. As part of my studies to become a primary school teacher, I majored in Catholic theology and art. At the age of nine, shortly after my first communion, as an altar girl, I felt that the place behind the altar is my home. At that time, I was completely new in my parish that girls were even allowed to serve as altar girls. I was one of the first girls in my parish. During my puberty, my youth pastor at the time, and especially the parish representative women noticed very clearly that I felt called to a way in the church. When I was 19, I had a very concrete vocation experience. I was given to understand that you will become a Roman Catholic women priest. You won't be one of the first, but you will be the first. The key is inside you. I will let you know when the time has come to offer this to the official church. Afterwards, I was able to see my own consecration in St. Peter's Basilica in a kind of film. For a long time, I kept quiet about what I have had experienced until the time came. In 2002, I was a guest at the ordination of the Danube 7 and then completed training as a deacon priest from the RCWP and was ordained as a deacon in Austria in 2005. I volunteered to do pretty much everything in the community, in my parish, from altar girl to sacristan and have been on the parish council for decades. I have also been leading Word of God celebrations for almost 30 years until my great commitment and my ordination as a deacon was denounced all the way to Rome. 
a preliminary investigation was initiated, the result of which was that I cannot be excommunicated despite the ordination, as the women's diaconate case has not yet been finally decided. Some things were forbidden to me by the bishop, but I have now regained almost everything and I'm increasingly taking on leadership roles in my community and my parish. I have been involved with RCWP for years and I'm active in the reform groups Maria 2.0 and We Are Church here in Germany. I have been part of the Christophorus Prelatur experiment for almost one and a half year now and trying to bring our feminist positions to the men and find concrete ways to implement them together. Not easy, but exciting. Especially since our women's networking now takes place worldwide and we know from so many women around the world that they feel called to the diaconate and the priesthood. And it was so moving last year in October 2000. 23 to get to know many of these women personally in Rome during the World Synod and to hear their stories. Now it is time to refresh my theological studies and learn the missing elements so that I can perhaps be ordained as a priest next year or the year after. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Regina. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else that uh, would like to share? Um, Suzanne. Excuse me. Before we continue, could we have a short break for okay. the interpreters? Would that be okay? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. So we can be back in 10 minutes okay. with interpretation. We can have a coffee meanwhile. I'll stop the recording as well in these 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. And uh, Mary, Mary Theresa, um, Christina won't interpret anymore because one just left the meeting. Okay, just to let you know, Francisco will keep interpreting, but Fran uh, Christina will stop. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Problem. Okay, so we can be back at five two. That's okay. Five to two. Wonderful. Okay. So we're going to take a little break now. Give everybody a little break, and we will be back at. Um, 155 with interpretation. Thank you everyone so much. We will continue. Thank you. Thank you. It's very Welcome back everyone to continuing our program and our sharing on our focus question today. When you heard the call to priesthood, how did you respond and overcome any barriers? Please keep your response two to three minutes so we can hear from as many people as possible. Thank you very, very much. So, Suze, why don't you start us? Okay. Excuse me. Before we begin, I wanted to remind you to activate. You need to activate your interpreting once again. Okay, so you need to click on the globe icon. You'll see on your screen, the bottom part of your screen. And then choose the English channel. Okay, and uh, I'll explain this to the Spanish people, speaking people. Sorry. Hola, nada. De nuevo, simplemente recordaros que tenéis que activar la función de interpretación en el icono del globo terráqueo que aparece en pantalla y seleccionar español. Eso es todo. Muchas gracias. Thank you. You can begin. Sorry. So are we ready? Yes. I just want to uh, congratulate you, Regina, for being our permanent deacon. Frequently we say we don't have deacons, but you've been an example of our permanent deacon. Um, I'm not sure I had a call. I don't know if I had a call or not. I um, don't recall anything, you know, being hit lightning bolts or whatever. I do remember playing mass. I remember uh, sitting in that third pew all the time wanting to be a priest, but I don't recall a call. What I did happen to me is I read an article called, of all ironic things, The Lady is a Bishop, which was about Patricia Friesen in the Call to Action magazine in 2006 or five, maybe even. And I uh, contacted her and I think she called me. Um, so I think that's how I actually got involved. You know, we've been talking about these singular uh, initial calls that we've all you know, gotten in some form or another. And um, 
I guess I'd like to challenge us to think at some point of a collective call. What is our collective call now um, as a group? Uh, how are we going to sustain ourselves? I hate to be an editorial fact checker, but we don't have 350 people. We never did. We have 254 ordained people right now. And one of the things that was a uh, difficulty for me in the very beginning was nobody knew who anybody was. There was no lists. There were no telephone numbers. There were no addresses. There was nothing in 2006. And so that's how I got started with all of this administrative label. But um, I think we have a, uh, a challenge for a collective call as far as our movement, as far as oppression of women and children, what are we doing for the sustainability of this movement? We've had 90 former members, 90, worldwide. Right now we are at 295. I hate to throw stats to us, but the fact of the matter is, and I feel like the canary in the mine, I don't see us growing. In all reality, where are we growing? That we can't get to even that 300 marks. So I see a, a real challenge of us working together worldwide for some kind of collective call about what we're all about. So I guess I would just challenge you all for that. Um, I, the book is a wonderful beginning and it's you know a good academic study, but how are we getting to the people in the pews? How are we really talking to the people and uh, not just our, our uh, preaching to our own choir, so to speak. So anyway, hate to be a bummer or a downer, but Facts are facts here, everybody, and we've not moved that dial for five years or more to the 300 mark. So we need to look at the growth and who we're about collectively, I think, and what's the collective call. So that's just my uh, two cents worth. Thank you, Suzanne and uh, Sharon. Uh, thank you, Suzanne. You know, I don't know where I found the list that had 350 <laughs> at one point in time. So I'm glad for facts because I tend to check them as well. Um, I do know that at least three of the people that we highlighted have died since we started our process. So that's also a truth and I'm um, in sympathy for, for what you're saying. And I just, 27, I, yeah, they're sorry for interrupting you, but 27 are deceased. Yeah. But only three of the ones that we interviewed is what I was saying. Uh, so um, I did want to just respond once to Regina. And Regina, it would be a great honor for me if you would communicate to Ida how important her work has been in this process on our behalf. Um, we have not communicated with her personally. We used her writings. But from the very, very beginning of our research, her name kept popping up as influencing as early as the Second Vatican Council and prior to that. So um, I just think her theological acumen has been extraordinary in supporting this movement. And I, I'd be so helped if you'd extend my gratitude to her. I see her on Thursday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And uh, either Dottie or Joan. Yes, hello. I'm Dottie Shigru, and I, um, I'm a priest with ARCWP. And um, in fact, I'll be celebrating my 13th anniversary on September 11th as ordained as a priest. Um, I want to start with what, what um, which wasn't my initial start with what um, um, Sue's just said about the collective, looking at a collective call. I, I, I didn't ever think of it that way, Sue's, but I think that's absolutely critical. And I think that sometimes some of the folks that are asking to be members of the women priesthood movement don't understand what movement it really is. And um, because there isn't, we have, we have a significant number of people, and I'm sure that's true of RCWP as well, that really don't participate. 
um, very strongly in, in the activities of um, either at annual meetings or all the awesome programs that People's Catholic Seminary present to us. Um, so, so I think that there's a lot of education that needs to be done on that concept of collective call. And I'm, I'm really going to think about it um, and pray about it and be in touch with you um, because I, I think it's a critical issue. Um, the older I get, I don't mind telling you I'm 81 years old. I was ordained late in life, but I certainly wanted to be a priest since I was seven. And I discussed that with my mother and we had quite a discussion. I discussed other things that I thought were unfair at that time, at that young age, um, that girls couldn't do. Um, and by the time I got to the fifth grade, we moved to a brand new project, um, a, um, a, a uh, one of those like condominiums, but a project, low income. I was one of seven children. And I, I know we moved there in the fifth grade and that's when I set up an altar in a bedroom. My, there were four girls in my family and three boys. The four girls slept in one room. And I set up my altar as, as I set up my altar on top of my bureau and it didn't come down for a long, long time. In fact, um, even my friends knew that altar was in my room and they used to tease me about it and thought, you know, you think you're gonna be a priest, the day will never come. My mother used to encourage me, my Irish Catholic mother who went to church as often as she could every day and had this wonderful prayer book that I just recently found in an old box that my younger sister had with all sorts of um, wonderful things. And, and she was the person who really said to me, you know, if you don't, if you don't live, you don't think you're going to live long enough to be a priest, you should leave the Roman Catholics and go join the Episcopalians. I said, mommy, I'm Irish Catholic, remember? We don't do those kinds of things. So, so it was very early on that I knew that's what I wanted to do. And since I couldn't, I entered religious life, the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur, the same community that Paula once belonged to. And she was in the Maryland province and I was in the Connecticut province. And I was in that community for almost 30 years, 28 years. And it was a wonderful experience, but I grew more and more discontent with the institutional church. So I'm really glad that I met Bridget Mary and Mary Mother of Jesus because it opened this door for me. And um, it's been a pretty terrific experience. So thanks for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Dottie. Thank you, Dottie. And Teresa? I would like to just add something to the conversation that what mm -hmm. I found was the insistent call from the people that I worked with in the pews. Um, and I felt that over the 30 years of my ministry, that from the when I was a, just a young tyke, uh, you know, just starting out in ministry and the charismatic prayer group drug me in one day into their meeting and I was not a charismatic prayer, but they said, Teresa, the God has told us to pray over you. And I would stand there dutifully and let them pray over me. And they said, there's something going on with you. We don't know what it is, but there's something you're going to do. And uh, they were pretty insistent with their prayer too. Um, later in ministry, when I was a parish life director in, in Idaho and people would come out of the church and uh, I was I was the canonical um, appointee for that parish and I had a priest sacramental minister and people would come out and they would say, what was that we just did? And I said, well, that, that was mass. And no, no, we don't have mass like that. And uh, this is a resort town in Iowa or Philadelphia. We don't, we don't do that there, you know, what was going on there. And there was such a companionship that I had with the priest ministers that I worked with and such a freedom and a call from some of my, you know, male counterparts in the, you know, the more traditional church that allowed me to be uh, and do what I could be and do. And I felt that throughout my ministry too. Um, you know, I've known Sharon for, most of my life. And just the call that she gave me as, as a lay woman, um, the women religious that called me, the people in the pew, to where finally toward the end of my career um, of ministry in the Catholic Church, when um, 
the the bishop of Idaho at that time told me that there wasn't any place in 56,000 square miles that he wanted me to serve in the diocese any longer um, because the priest didn't want to work with me. I knew that who wanted to work with me were the people in the pew. <laughs> the, the, the people who called me wanted to work with me. Um, and, it, and it was really never from the bishops that I felt a, a call to priesthood, but it was always just from the people. And uh, that was what sustained me and continued me on my journey then once I left formal ministry to uh, accept a call to becoming a Roman Catholic woman priest and continuing with the small community in Idaho, even though I live abroad some part of the year, you know, we connect. We just had a lovely um, service last Sunday over Zoom where they gather in a house and I am here and others were coming from other places and and just uh, just enjoying that company and that being with. But I would say that the insistent call of God through the people of God um, is is uh, what I couldn't ignore um, and finally had to say yes to. Um, and so I, I think uh, Jeanette and Sharon for writing this book and for all of you and all of the insistent calls that you could not ignore as well. Um, wherever they might come from, um, there is an insistence of the spirit to call us to be who we are called to be. And so thank you for saying yes. and. And I, I thank myself also in gratitude for my courage to say yes as well. Thank, thank you, Teresa. Teresa. And Paula and Ed. Well, I didn't want to take too much time here because I want to hear other people's call, but my story of their call, but my call is in, um, is in the book. And what I want to thank uh, Sharon and a Jeanette for is that is they really use my voice. I really heard myself when I read the what they wrote because uh, and I appreciate that it came through very clearly because my call was very uh, dramatic to me. I didn't expect it. I've always supported women priests that I knew of, but never uh, felt called to it myself until January 15th, 2012, when I was reading the call of Samuel, and I sat down and said, speak God, your servant is listening, and as clear as anything I heard God say, I want you to be a priest, and I responded physically, I cried, I shook, my body just shook, and fortunately, I had this guy right next to me, and he said, keep listening, keep listening, it's from God, you'll keep getting it, and I did, and when I told my praying community about my call, about that day, they clapped, they shouted, they hugged me, they affirmed me. They said, we knew it, we knew it. And so it was to hear, to be affirmed, first called by God and then by my community and then recognizing it myself. Um, uh, I, I just really appreciate it. And I, uh, again, I can't thank Sharon and, and um, uh, Jeanette enough for putting this all into words. So thank you. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Paula. And Miriam. Yeah. Hey. Miriam, you need to unmute. Eh, perdona, ¿cómo se pone la mano levantada aquí? Que no lo sé. Your hand. Uh, Elaine, no did you No, uh, Belin. Oh, Belin. Yes. Oh, they'll help. Okay. Uh, Miriam, I think we called okay. on Miriam. Go ahead, so, Miriam. Um, my name is Miriam Ficconi, and I'm a Roman Catholic woman priest from... Florida. No sé though, dónde I pone. Bueno, originate, eh. though I didn't originate from Florida. Um, vale. I uh, I was a Catholic ya, sister no for veo. Vale. 25 Pero bueno, years. Como que tengo la I, was mano a, levantada, ¿vale? I was a Trinitarian sister. Busco. And so my whole life has been dedicated, was dedicated to serving the church and the people of God. And I absolutely loved ministry because that truly was my calling. And probably the last Eight years, uh, 10 years of my life, I began more in leadership roles. And at my last uh, ministry, I was the pastoral director of a parish. 
and uh, I had a priest who was a sacramental minister, and uh, we shared ministry, but a lot of times I was called to do word and communion services, visit the sick, and um, I worked with the RCIA program, and more and more people began asking me to do word and communion services, and um, uh, it, it was like I was doing everything but consecrating the, the sacraments. And yet I even had baptism at the hospital and all of this just started coming together for me. And it was like, I I know I was always called to service, but, you know, being exposed to doing that work, it just affirmed, this is what I want to do, but I couldn't. I kept saying, this is as far as I'm going to get or as close as I'm going to get to priesthood is, is doing word and communion services. Well, then as Providence would have it, um, they invited me out of that ministry because of a political situation, because I, they, they got my picture cheering at a Democratic conference. <laughs> well, that, that blossomed into uh, saying, okay, we don't need you anymore. Anyway, it was a very devastating experience after serving the church for 45 years. And um, so I came to Florida to retire. Lo and behold, I mean, it was in God's plan that I met, uh, well, my friend said, let's get in touch with this bishop over there in Sarasota. One thing led to another. There's, you know, there's so much to his story, but we. I was aware of the Roman Catholic women priest movement, but I never thought I would have the good spot to say yes. I mean, it takes a lot of courage to walk away from the church that you love, that you've ministered. This was your identity. This is who you're called to be. However, I got the chutzpah, <laughs> and you, through a process of prayer and discernment, I was able to let go of the fears of leaving the church because I realized my God was much bigger than the, than the, than the institutional church. And so, needless to say, one thing led to another, and, and the other ironic thing is we didn't have a community to begin with here. You know, we were new here, and so... How are we going to experience our, our, our ministry? Well, God provided ways for us to minister. And before you knew it, we were doing a liturgy at an interfaith service at a castle in St. Augustine, Florida. We ministered at a community that was established by married clergy who needed additional priests to celebrate liturgy. And before you know it, Wanda and I were down in Titusville celebrating liturgy twice a month. And so... Uh, and, and we were presented by, I was presented for ordination by an Episcopal priest who stood up for me and, and affirmed my gifts uh, to ministry. So it's a lot of little pieces that came together, but I am so grateful for the experiences that I've had that has given life uh, and expression to the gifts God gave me. And I'm very happy to be a to be a, a, a Catholic priest and um, thank you, Mary. Experience this. So thank, thank you, uh, Penny. Thank you, thank you. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Penny Donovan. I live in California. I've been a priest since 2016, and um, like several of you have said, my story began in, in when I was a kid, and we were visiting the uh, diocesan seminary, and I remember telling my mom I was like six years old, that I was going to come to school there because I was going to be a priest. And so my mom explained to me how it doesn't quite work that way in the Catholic Church. And I said, don't worry, it'll change by the time I'm grown up. <laughs> well, I figure either it took me a heck of a long time to grow up or <laughs> God found a way. But I, um, but I did the things you normally do when you can't be a priest. I entered religious life. Like Dottie, I was a sister of Notre Dame de Namur. I began teaching. I love teaching. I'm a natural teacher. And it was such a gift to me. And I love teaching science. And it was much later that I discovered why my love of science and spirituality are so interwoven. And um, but at the time, I, I realized, number one, I wasn't called to be a sister, but there was something else. And it took me years and years to realize what it was. And I later joined, uh, became an associate member of the Cincinnati Dominicans. Uh, and it was Diane Kennedy, I forget who mentioned her, who started that 
a particular organization, but uh, going to one of our regional meetings and seeing pink smoke. And that was just an ex explosion of, of emotion within me because I knew that God was opening this vast doorway. And what's so funny, and it, what struck me over and over, is what God's great sense of humor is like. Because I had visions of myself giving retreats. I mean, that's kind of what I saw myself doing. Um, the combining my love of science and my love of prayer, um, Celtic spirituality, drawing it all together and doing retreats. And that never happened. <laughs> I mean, it just didn't come to pass. And what has happened is a whole new ministry with the homeless. And we have a huge, as we, every large city has, a huge homeless population. The beauty of it is I'm also um, with the Magdala Catholic community who are a wonderful, wonderful group of people that... Um, that has been meeting. We started meeting in Juanita's home and I later moved in with Juanita, so our home. And we had a fantastic house church, but of course COVID. But they have continued being enormously generous and have supported our work with the homeless for years. And when I first began to realize that I could, in fact, realize my call to priesthood, the Magdala community supported me 150%, and I have always been so grateful for their support. So I have found my journey within priesthood to be as kind of windy as my journey to get here, but it's been a wonderful kind of windy, and I just feel myself so incredibly fortunate. And I'd like to thank you uh, both of you for writing this book and sharing some of these stories. People need to know God is working in the church, the lowercase church, which is the real church. Thank, Thank you, very you Annie. So Thank before you. we begin, we have uh, three more people to speak before we end today. So we'll start with Denise, then Belin, and then Connie, and then our time will be up. Okay. So Denise, if you would, you would continue. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am in Alaska. And my journey, I was not raised Catholic. So I'm one of the converts among all of you. My call to the Catholic Church, um, I had a very foundational, very strong um, Presbyterian. My parents were in the choir. So I had a real, um, I had that Bible knowledge and very strong faith. But in 78, I moved to Alaska with my husband, and there was no Presbyterian church I felt drawn to. They, So my neighbor called me and knew I played the guitar and had played at church. And she says, oh, the Dominicans are coming for a mission. We need you to come and play music. And I said, sure, okay. And I never left. Yeah. In 19... About 1986, we had moved to Haines, Alaska, and then we lost our priest. I was doing the music with another gentleman. And at that point, we had a bishop, Michael Kenny, who was very progressive. And he was from California. And he said, yeah, they sent me up to Alaska because they didn't like what I was talking about. He believed in women priests. He believed in the church the church is the people. And so when we lost our priest, he came to me and another lady and said, um, I'd like you to be the presider and take care of this community. And I just went, um, but I just do music. You know, <laughs> I'm a convert. I just do music. And, but you can't say no to your bishop. And he was a shepherd. He was a true shepherd. And I was thinking, what? I, I don't know. So that was my call to priesthood. And that was in 1987. Even though I didn't realize it, it formulated me because I began to lead services on Saturday evenings in Alaska. And we would get a priest maybe once every four or five months. And so again, the community formed me. Um, I went to Oregon and after 
um, the priest at in McMinnville found out that I had presided. He said, oh, I'm going to take Fridays off, so I want you to preside. And I go, are you sure? I said, do we need permission from the bishop? Because I had a letter. I said, here's my letter from my bishop saying I can preside. And he goes, uh... <laughs> I think we'll just do this and, you know, not really ask for permission. So I, again, like many of you served in the church and presided at graveside services. We had a school, I did school liturgies and it continued to grow. And it was the people in the pews that said, you know, when you preside at a communion and, and Eucharist service, of course, not consecrating, they could see the gift that all of us, you know, many of us have experienced. And um, it just went from there. And then I was working the parish. So I had the catacomb when uh, I was part of another community, Lumen Christi in McMinnville, and was so worried that the church would find out and I'd get fired. And my husband was legally blind at that time, and I was the sole provider. So I can't, how am I going to do this and not lose my job? Because I was supporting our family, and we had six kids. And it all worked out. And I'm back in Alaska, and um, I, have, I have two little communities here. So pray for us. And just... I love the idea that Sue's brought up too. We are one. We are one movement and we need to support and acknowledge and pray for each other. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Denise. And Denise. Bueno, eh, saludaros a todas. Y no, bueno, primero deciros que soy de Valladolid, España y que eh, se me va a nombrar presbítera el próximo 13 de octubre en Roma. Eh, yo sé que todas, eh, lógicamente, hemos pasado por dificultades y caminos difíciles, ¿no? Pero en mi caso, eh, si algo me ca ha caracterizado siempre, es que he ido como Juana de Arco por la vida. Es decir, a guerrear por mi cuenta. Nunca he tenido una comunidad. Esta es la primera vez que yo siento que tengo que personas que van en mi, misma, en mi mismo camino. Entonces, agradeceros a todos, primero, por haber dicho, perdonad, por haber dicho que sí, ¿no? Porque gracias a vosotras estoy aquí, ¿no? Cada una de vosotras. Mi camino empezó cuando era joven, mis padres eran comunistas, no creían en Dios para nada. Y tuve, bueno, pues un día pasé por una iglesia, entré y ahí conocí a un cura que es el que me llevó a Cristo directamente. Eh, él nos dijo un día, tenéis que volveros a bautizar porque el, el bautismo es un sí de cada uno personal, no vale el de, el, el de cuando erais chiquitines, ¿no? Y cada uno o cada una tenéis que decir una frase que os caracterice durante la vida en público, ¿no?, a, a toda la comunidad, era, yo dije, Señor, haz de mí lo que quieras, y realmente lo he hecho, hasta llegar aquí, yo tengo 65 años, jamás pensé que podía llegar aquí, pero yo ese día acepté a Cristo como mi objetivo principal en la vida, y también tuve una opción personal dentro de mí, que es dedicarme siempre a los que más sufrían, a los más marginados, a los que más necesitaban de la voz de Jesús, de Nazaret. Y esa ha sido mi vida. Eh, me fui con los gitanos, con la comunidad gitana a vivir a las chabolas, luego fui del primer piso de drogadictos en, en Valladolid, luego la primera asociación de mujeres, todo ha sido, pero ha sido una lucha en solitario prácticamente, ¿no? Eh, he sido directora de tres casas de acogida para mujeres maltratadas, todo ha sido así, ¿no? Y hasta que una de esas... Llevo un grupo, un grupo de oración, ahora, que por cierto, se han dado de baja algunos y algunas cuando se han enterado de, de mi ordenación. Y, y, y ahora la lucha es de que ese, ese grupo que, en el, con el que comparto cosas, 
pues eh, llegué a entender también las reivindicaciones de la mujer en, en la iglesia católica, ¿no? Toda esta experiencia me ha llevado a que me echaran de las iglesias, a que no me dejaran entrar, a que no me miren por la calle. Siempre he intentado entrar. Mi, mi, mi ilusión máxima era poder dar comulgar, ¿no? Porque mi vocación al final era, Señor, mi petición era, déjame dar una eucaristía. Y lo más cerca que voy a estar de dar una eucaristía es leer las lecturas en la misa y dar la comunión. Eso se me permitió, pero a los dos meses me echaron. Vamos, me echaron. Amablemente me echaron, ¿no? Entonces, bueno, pues gracias por estar aquí todas. Gracias por hacerme experimentar una nueva dimensión en mi fe, que es la comunidad. Y espero, bueno, aquí me tenéis para lo que queráis. Thank you, Belén. Thank you, Belén. Okay. And Gracias. Connie, you are our last person because oh. Nada, vosotros. Hello. Well, um, okay. Uh, no. uh, uh, Francisco, can we go a little over or, or do you need to no leave? Sé si seré... we... eh, no sé si so Connie yo... and then, to, uh, then Maria Teresa and then we need to stop. stop. Okay, Connie. Okay, I'm Connie Blake, and I'm an associate of the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, but I live in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I have known of Miriam and Wanda for a number of years because they were also associates of the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth. During COVID, I felt abandoned by the institutional church. Uh, no one from the parishes reached out to any of us, and we were just kind of wandering But somehow or another, I received an email that invited me to join Miriam and Wanda in the Heart of God Inclusive Community, which I've been a part for several years now. I can't remember not being a part of them. I am not a priest, but I have to tell you all that the mothering and the shepherding that our inclusive community has received over these many months and years is beyond description. Miriam and Wanda may not be able to go to the castle anymore and at this point in their lives and minister to communities, but Zoom has brought us together in ways that I never imagined could happen because it certainly didn't happen in my parish. It didn't happen in the institutional church. So what I want to say is if you all ever, if any of you ever feel like you are not doing enough Just think of that one person out there in Zoom land or in your community or wherever that you have reached out to and touched in ways that you didn't even know were possible. So as a member, a family member of the Heart of God Inclusive Community, I cannot thank you women and men who were brave enough to answer the call and to say yes and risk whatever you had to risk to get this far. So thank, thank you. you very much. And so we, our last person coming on now is Maria Teresa, who is one of our, also one of our new candidates. So Maria Teresa, you will close us out. <laughs> yeah. Hola, buenas tardes. Bueno, no sé si me quedaré sin batería. Estoy fuera de casa. ¿Eh? Entonces voy a ser muy cortita. Lo primero de todo, daros las gracias. ¿eh? Yo quiero dar las gracias por lo valientes que soy ¿eh? Eh, de dar este paso que a los ojos de mucha gente, pues bueno, estamos haciendo algo que no, que no está bien. Pero yo creo que a los ojos de Dios sí que está bien. ¿eh? Sí que está bien. Bueno, me llamo María Teresa, eh, soy de aquí de un pueblo de, de, de Huelva, que es Isla Cristina en Andalucía, eh, bueno, yo vocación de sacerdote lo tengo desde, a, desde que tenía 17 años, eh, lo que pasa es que cuando yo se lo dije a un sacerdote, eh, me dijo que como eso no podía hacer dentro de la iglesia, que me metiera religiosa, y he sido religiosa 11 años en una comunidad que se llaman Hermanas de la Cruz, y después estuve en otra comunidad religiosa 7 años. Hasta que, bueno, hasta que pasó un problema dentro de, 
de la comunidad parroquial. Y bueno, ya eh, he pasado dos años muy difíciles, eh, tanto personales como de tema de fe, ¿vale? Como todas vosotras. ¿eh? Mi historia no es diferente, es muy parecida. Sentimos un abandono de aquellos que, bueno, que deberían de, vi de vivir la misericordia y el perdón. Aquello que predicamos lo deberíamos de vivir. Entonces, en ese momento tan, tan difícil para mí, pues me encontré con un vídeo, ¿vale? Donde sale Cristina y donde sale otra muchacha, ¿vale? En el que hablaban del sacerdocio de la mujer. Entonces empecé a conoceros, empecé a conoceros. Y bueno, me puse en contacto con Cristina. Y bueno, hemos estado unos meses conociéndonos hasta que ya... Eh, no es que se me quitara el miedo, porque claro, yo lo primero que pensé, creo que es lo que habéis pensado muchas, que la Iglesia nos excomulgaba. Y claro, yo desde que tengo uso de razón, vivir sin la Iglesia es como in, vivir sin, sin respirar, es imposible. Yo creía que era así, ¿vale? Entonces yo mi miedo era que, bueno, ¿y, y cómo que me excomulgan? Y si después, pero bueno... Yo siempre he confiado mucho en la providencia de Dios y yo sé que Dios está en medio de aquellos que estamos luchando por hacer solo su voluntad, no la voluntad de nadie, sino la de Él. Yo creo firmemente que la voluntad de Él es que yo dé este paso que Él lleva tanto tiempo esperando ¿eh? y yo creo que ya es hora de dar ese paso. Estoy sumamente agradecida y feliz de conoceros de conocer vuestras historias, de saber que hay gente que, 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 que quieren hacer algo que muchas personas no pueden hacer. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here with us today. We'll see you next week, Tuesday. At one o'clock, same time, the topic is vale. the second dimension of the book, Ministries. We will share on Ministries first with Sharon and Jeanette, and then we will have an opportunity to share on our Ministries, our diverse Ministries. See you then. Thank you so much. Many, many blessings. Thank you. And to our interpreters, to thank Jerry you. and Francis. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was wonderful.